It's strange days we live in. All right, take your Bibles this morning. Find both places again that we were at last Sunday. Find 2 Peter chapter 3. Hold your place there. And then go back to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Am I on this morning? 2 Timothy chapter 4, as you stand this morning. Amen. Jumping cat Christians up and down. Praise God. Are you glad you saved us? Amen. 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 I hope you are. Because if you're not and you're saved, you can't, you know, you can't get out of it now. Sorry. You're in the wrong dispensation to get out of it. Amen. Alright, Saint Timothy chapter 4 this morning, verse number 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Well, those are things that you and I want on our record as well. Yeah. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now, I said this last Sunday morning, and I want to remind you of it again. If verse 7 does not apply to your life, then you're not going to love him and his appearing. Amen. 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 Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You pray with me, and then you can be seated this morning. I have fallen our God this morning as we got in divine presence. Again, I certainly want to thank you, Father, for this wonderful day that you blessed us with. And Father, it truly is wonderful because it's another day and another opportunity that we have to be able to come and be in your house. And Father, certainly this morning we pray that as we've gathered together here, we trust that you'll move in our midst. And Father, that you'll speak to our hearts today through the preaching of your word. God, I trust that the Holy Ghost of God. I would have liberty this morning, God, just to speak to our hearts in a manner, dear God, such as each of us need as individuals. Father, I pray this morning, God, that you'll anoint me afresh and anew, and God, that you'd give me liberty and unction this morning, and Lord, that you'd lead me in the direction that you'd have me to go. And God, help us in these last days, Father, to be faithful. God, this admonition given by the Apostle Paul to young Timothy, I is God one that we need ourselves this day. I, Father, I trust that you'll help us. I, I certainly, Father, I, I to be faithful in this Laodicean age. I, and Father, stand for the truth. I, but God, we understand this morning and realize more and more each day I, how we need your touch and how we need I, I, your grace in our lives. I, God, help us now, I pray, I, as we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. I, and Father, for his sake, help us today. Amen and amen. All right, go ahead and be seated right there. And uh, uh, look with me again in verse number 2. And then we'll go back to the book of 2 Peter. Uh, in verse number 2, the Bible said this. Uh, it said, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, uh, with all long suffering and doctrine. Uh, and that word exhort, uh, I told you this last Sunday morning. The word exhort, it means to incite or to animate by words or advice. And the best advice that any of you will ever be able to receive is the advice that comes from the Word 
of God. And the greatest advice that any of us can ever give to someone else is the words that we find in this blessed old black book. Amen. Amen. But that word insight, insight means to stir up. And so let's go from there over to the book of 2 Peter. In 2 Peter chapter number 3, look at what Peter says here in verse number 1. He said, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stirred up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Now, can I just say this to you this morning? The only way that you're going to have a pure mind is by having the mind of Christ. And the only way that you're going to have the mind of Christ is that you have the Word of God in your mind. David said, Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. So if you're going to have a pure mind, friend, it's got to be a mind that is centered and focused upon the very words of God. In verse number 2, the Bible said this, that you might be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, that's the Old Testament, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. There's the New Testament. And so you and I need to be stirred up by the entire book, not just by a portion of the book in this New Testament age, but we need to be stirred up by all of the words Amen. of God. The Bible said in verse number 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Well, absolutely. I, I pray, listen, I, I, that's that apostate crowd. I, and then the Bible said this in verse 4 and saying, where is the promise of His coming? I, well, can I tell you, friend, I, He did make that promise and He is coming. I, it yeah. doesn't make any difference how many scoffers we have. I, and you do realize that every time we have I, I, some big name individual come on the scene that begins to set dates and then that day comes and it passes I, and the Lord doesn't come and the end of the world doesn't take place, I, then that just multiplies the scoffers around the world. I, yeah. And it gives them the ammunition that they need to understand and scoff against the things of God. I, That's right. Hey, friend, but can I just admonish you this morning? I, just be faithful. I, I, just as God I, has promised and as God has come through over and over again in yeah. our lives, I, I, I can guarantee you this, I, I, that in His time, I, He will step out in the clouds of heaven. Yeah. And in His time, I, that trumpet will sound. I, and in His time, thank God, I, we will be called up yeah. in this earth. I, and we'll be out of here. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, don't listen to the scoffers. Scoffers try to discourage you as they try to discredit the Word of God. How the friends you and I know that the only book credible today is the one that we hold in our laps this morning. Yeah. It is the only one that you and I can trust. It is the one that you and I can follow. And thank God it will lead us through to the end. But we began looking at this, and I didn't even give you the title of the message last week. I think they wrote it down in the booth as just simply Uh, uh, but that's not the title that I intended to use. Uh, uh, The title of the message this morning, uh, as well as last Sunday morning, is this. Uh, Let's get stirred up. Amen. Uh, Let's get stirred up. Uh, I've told you, friend, for 19 and a half years, I don't like morgues. I don't like the mortuary. I I don't like graveyards. I don't like uh, uh, the funeral home. I I don't like being around people uh, uh, that act like they're dead. Amen. I, yeah. I like, I, listen, I'm a part of the living. I, I'm a part of the land of the living. I, I'm alive. I'm well. I'm breathing. Thank God. I, but more than just being alive and well this morning, I, I physically, I, thank God I'm alive and well spiritually. I, it's blessed I, a day, friend, I, I, whenever we're mindful of the fact I, that God passed by our lives one day I, yeah. and saved a bunch of hell deserving yeah. sinners. And God infused. And God put his life inside of us. Can I tell you this morning, friend, that God's not dead? Can I tell you this morning how Jesus is not dead? Can I tell you this morning that the Holy Ghost of God doesn't have a headache or a toothache or a toeache? Then everything is all right with the Trinity. Amen. Everything should be all right with me and you. 
Yeah. Well, we looked at three things, and I'll give you those three things hurriedly uh, uh, for the benefit of those that weren't here. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 34, verse number 16, the Bible said this, uh, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord. Uh, uh, amen. Uh, uh, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Uh, and then we went over to 1 Timothy chapter 4 uh, and read verses 13 down to the rest of that chapter. Uh, and uh, we saw uh, uh, where God said uh, uh, through Paul to young Timothy, uh, to give attendance to reading. If you're going to be stirred up this morning, then you need to seek you out of the book of the Lord and read. Read the Word of God. I'm telling you, that's just something wonderful about the Word of God. Yeah, if you spend time in the book of God, you'll just be going along reading, friend, and all of a sudden something will jump out at you. Something will fuse new life inside you, yeah. and you'll get excited, thank God, about something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, friend, listen, as you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are transitional books, and they are dealing with the earthly ministry of Jesus, and it is that time when the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven were both being offered back to the nation of Israel. But man, as you see, all that transpired, and then even as you realize this, John said, if everything had been written, the world would not have contained it all. Amen. I mean, friend, just three and a half years of what Jesus did while he was here. The world could not have contained the volumes of the book, the books that would have been written about him. But just the things that were left, amen, are things to excite us to know in. Yeah. I don't understand the generation that doesn't get excited about the Word of God anymore. That's right. I don't understand why you can't see as God touched and as God blessed and as God moved in the lives of others. God still wants to do the same for you. And when you seek you out of the book of the Lord and read, and when you read what God has done for others, it ought to excite you, amen. When you go back and find Jeremiah discouraged and sinking in that mire, but thank God how the Word of God became a fire in his bones. It ought to be the very same thing for you. The very next time you're discouraged and you're down and you're sinking in the mire, thank God that you ought to be stirred up by the Word of God and what you've sucked out of this book in the past. Amen. Amen. The second thing we saw was in John 5, 39. The Bible said, search the Scriptures. And so you seek you out of the book of the Lord and read, and you ought to get stirred up. And you ought to search the scriptures. And you ought to get stirred up. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I don't have time to go back all over that. Get you a tape of last Sunday. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15 was the third thing. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A word that need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Man, I'm telling you, it ought to stir you up when you learn to rightly divide the word of truth. And that comes through study. A study. A study. A much study is a weariness of the flesh. Thank God, listen, as I close last Sunday morning, I said this. As we look back there in Ecclesiastes chapter number 12, listen, I give a chance to read. Make it of many books, there is no end. You do need to read something just other than beside your Bible. You need to give attendance to read. And you need to give attendance to stay. And you need to learn how to write and divide the word of truth. And as you learn how to write and divide the word of truth, thank God, let's get stirred up. Amen. Amen. Man, I remember well how the afternoon that I came in from work and I sat down on the couch and I was there by myself and I got my Bible out and I was just a young preacher. I was still in the Southern Baptist Church but I was hanging around with the independent crowd and they were trying to pull me away from the Southern Baptist Association and I meant that the controversy I was over post-millennial doctrine and pre-millennial doctrine and that's what the whole controversy was over. Over there in East Tennessee, all the Southern Baptists at that time were post-millennial. All of the independents were pre-millennial. And then they went to war over that doctrine. Amen. And one side called the other side a heretic. Amen. And then I just come in and I sit down and I 
said, Lord, I said, please, I've got to make a decision. That decision needs to be made today. Lord, I need you to open my eyes. I need you to give me help. I need to get this thing right. And man, I'm telling you, I just opened up my Bible. And God, I just, man, it opened to Revelation chapter 1. And I looked at verse number 19. And it was like that verse just jumped out at me. It said, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And then God just, just rolled back heaven and just revealed to me what the rapture was, and what the tribulation was, and what the millennial was, and what the part that second part that second advent. I mean, man, right there in the living room, God just opened it all up to me. And I had me a bad because of fear, amen. I, I run up and down the hall. I, I shouted in victory. I, I went outside, ran around the trailer a couple of times. I, and I looked over I, at the little Southern Baptist church I, I, that I'd been licensed out of the preach. I, and I said, goodbye, amen. I, it's yeah. time for me to check out. I, it's time for me to leave. I, and God showed me the crowd that I'm supposed to be in. I, Amen. 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 Rightly yeah. dividing the word of truth. Well, I hate that some of y'all ain't going to get stirred up. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'll give you the fourth thing this morning. Ephesians chapter 4. I like this. Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says this in verse number 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now, what are they going to deceive with? False doctrine. Yeah. Doctrine is so important to the child of God. You must be doctrinally sound. You must be doctrinally grounded. Why? Yeah. If you're not, then one of these that are lying in wait for you is going to catch you with some other wind of doctrine and you're going to sell off in the wrong direction. Amen. But now notice verse number 15. Verse 15 said this, but speaking the truth love. in love. Yes, sir. But speaking the truth, what is truth? It's sound doctrine. Speaking the truth. So hey, let's get stirred up. How do we start? We start by seek you out the book of the Lord and read. Then what do we do? We search the scriptures. And then what do we do, preacher? Then we study. So we can rightly define the word of truth. And now that we've got it, thank God. Let's get stirred up by speaking that truth in love. Amen. Amen. Hello? By speaking the truth in love. Hey, I look. Politics gets some of y'all stirred up. The economy gets some of y'all stirred up. The job situation gets some of y'all stirred up. Sodomites get you stirred up. I mean, friend, you can sit down and watch the nightly news and get stirred up about what's going on, not only in your surrounding community and area, but you get to watch the nightly news, you get stirred up about things that's going on in other countries. Well, hey, hey, they're speaking oftentimes lies from their liberal hearts. Why don't you and I speak the truth in love, amen, amen. and get stirred up? Amen. amen. Speaking the truth in love. Why, well, look, we've got a lot to talk about. Yeah. Amen. Hello? Amen. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and comfort. Do you not understand that even when we reprove and rebuke, that we're to speak the truth in love? Why would we rebuke an individual? For the same reason a mother rebukes their child? Because that mother loves that child. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Now you and I have got the truth. Why shouldn't we speak it? Amen. Why should you not want to go to the workplace tomorrow? Now listen, there's going to be individuals 
angels in the worst place. They're going to be talking about what happened over the weekend in their lives. Well, why don't you talk about what went on in your life over That's the right. weekend? Why don't you talk about what you learned in Sunday school? Why don't you talk about what you learned? I've been in the 11 o'clock preaching service. Why don't you talk about Jesus and the Word of yeah. God? Amen. Hey, if you have been seeking out of the book of the Lord and reading, you've got a lot of truth under your belt. You've got a lot to talk about in you. Amen. Amen. Folks used to get stirred up talking about the truth. Right. Yeah. Now we get stirred up over lies. Right, preacher. Hello? Look in Acts chapter 14. Speaking the truth in love. That's how we ought to get stirred up. In Acts chapter number 14. Look at verse number 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so what? Is everybody there? Are you there? Are you in Acts 14? Verse number 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so what? Hey. That a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, did what? Believe. Well, they had to be speaking the truth in love, amen. They weren't speaking lies. They weren't speaking fables. They were speaking the truth in love, amen. And what happened? Many believed. Yeah. That's not all that happened. Look at what happens in verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles. Man, hey, look, somebody's always going to get offended even when you speak the truth in love. Yeah. Some unbeliever is going to get offended. Right, man. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time, therefore, about they speaking boldly in the Lord. Hey, listen, I, uh, they didn't let this bother them. Uh, Paul didn't say, all right, it's time to leave town. Uh, no, friend, he wasn't going to leave town until it was time to leave town. Uh, but he's going to hang around uh, and he's going to speak the truth in love. Amen. And then notice what it says. The Bible said this, Long time therefore ago they speaking boldly in the Lord, uh, which gave testimony unto the word of His grace, uh, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hand. Uh, but the multitude in the city was divided. Uh, well, the truth always divides. Uh, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. Amen. Uh, and when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles, but now listen, uh, this was after a long time. We don't know how long, but we know it was after a long time. And also the Jews with their rulers, uh, to use them despitefully in the stone, they, uh, they were aware of it, and fled unto Lystra and Berk, uh, uh, cities of Lyconia, uh, and under the region that lies round about. Uh, and there they preached the gospel. Uh, they preached the gospel. What did they do? Uh, they spoke the truth in love. Amen. Amen. Go back to the book of Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Boy, I like this. I was just reading the other morning. Every time I read this particular verse, it just stirs me up. I don't know about the rest of them, but this verse stirs me up. In Mark chapter 2, in verse number 1, the Bible said this, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. You know what that means? That means that some folks went running throughout the city of Capernaum and spoke the truth in love. What's the truth? He's in the house. Amen. Man, yeah. Man, I like that. I've been pastoring all these years and not one time in all of these years have I ever knocked on the door to invite somebody to Jesus or invite somebody to church and them asked me this question. Not one time. Preacher, is Jesus there? La, 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 la. I've had a lot of questions asked, but I've never had that question asked. If they've got kids or teenagers, it's always, what kind of programs do you have for our kids? Yeah. If they really like singing, what kind of singing do you have at the church? Yeah. Amen. Amen? Yeah. And it's all, always fleshly things. But not one time have I ever had anybody in that bunch that said, well, preach, I just 
just want to know one thing. Is Jesus there? Is Jesus there? Speaking the truth in love. You know what? You should be able to go every time you've been to the house of God and it ought to be so and it would be so if we're where we're supposed to be. Now, whenever they're talking about how the great fellowship meal they had in the workplace tomorrow after their service and nothing's ever said about the choir singing and nothing's ever said about what they learned in Sunday school and nothing's ever said about the message but they're just talking about the big spread that the ladies put on. You ought to be able to walk up to them and say, Hey, buddy, let me tell you something. I, I thank God. I, it wasn't the ladies that put on the spread at Bingham Heights yesterday, I, but it was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Yep. I, I just want you to know I, that everybody didn't show up for service yesterday, I, but the one that mattered did. Amen. I, thank God I, that Jesus was in the midst. Amen. I, that Jesus was in the house of God. I, that Jesus sat down with me. I, and I sat down with Jesus, amen. amen. And thank God we sung together. And glory to God, it gave me the strength that I need to pick up one more step and go one more mile in my life and come to work one more Monday, amen. 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 It was noise to the broad that he was in the house. Amen. That ought to stir you up. He's in the house. Amen. Oh, Amen. I always stir people up in religious circles today by the name that we put out on the billboard. The, you know, the world famous evangelist that's coming to town or the world famous missionary that's coming to do the mission conference. Well, can I tell you, friend, it doesn't make no difference how many Dr. Bottle Stoppers you have come in if Jesus isn't in the house. Amen. It doesn't matter, amen. Yeah. Amen. Now, notice... What happens when it was noised that he was in the house? Verse 2 said, And straightway many were gathered together. Or were they gathered together in the house? They came to where he was at. Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. They didn't come to where the world famous choir was singing. Came to where he was at. Man. And the Bible said this. And straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. They could not fit in. No, not so much as about the door. And what did he do? He preached the word unto them. Now what was he doing? He was speaking the truth in love. Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. Speaking the truth in love. Yes, sir. Amen. Now I'll say this in passing. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? We prove them. So what do you do? You don't fellowship with them. That's right. right. But what you do do is you speak the truth to them in love. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so many illustrations that I could give right there, but man, if you don't get that, I want to get to the last point. You know, some of y'all are wondering about the two books up here. They're there for a reason. So let's let's speak in the truth and love. Man, you ought to look, seek you out the book of the Lord and read. And then what you read and what you have suck and look. Seek me so what? Uh, what? Uh, well, what you found is what you're going to speak about. Yep. Amen. Search the scriptures, for them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Amen. Man. You want to know more about Jesus as we saw a while ago? That hey, search the scriptures, amen. 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 Because they testify of him, praise God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And then study. 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 You know, it's it's tragic that in our day. We're sending kids off to college and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars for them to get a degree and there be no opening in the field that they've got their degree in and they're out doing something else. Yeah. Yeah. 
Somebody studies about horticulture and, and, and becomes a horticulturist and, and comes out looking for a job in that field and really has applied themselves. And the only place they can find a job is in McDonald's. Well, it's hard for you to have McDonald's to speak about horticulture. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 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 When you learn something, you shouldn't just want to apply it, but you should want to share it. Yeah. Amen. Hello? Amen. And you ought to want to find somebody to talk to. You ought to want to find somebody to share that with and speak the truth in love. Amen. Amen. Hello? Then here, here's going to be our last one. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. You should already know where we're going. Let's get stirred up. In Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. Look with me if you will please. Down at verse number... Well, let's start in verse 18. Verse 18, the Bible... Well, let's start in verse 17. Verse 17 is good. Oh, let's start in verse 16. It's really good. Redeeming the time. How do you redeem the time? Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. How's a good time to redeem the time? Preacher? Search the scriptures. Oh, how's a good time for me to redeem the time? Preacher, study and show yourself approved unto God. Oh, preacher, hey, I've been seeking, I've been searching, I've been studying. Now God's given me something. How should I redeem my time? Speak about it, amen. I amen. Else, amen. Go tell somebody what Jesus has shared with you out of the book. Amen. 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 Well, redeeming the time because the days of evil, wherefore be ye not unwise? Be ye not unwise? Be ye not unwise? Study. Study. Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be what? But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves. There it is. Speaking the truth in love. Yes. But that's not all that this verse contains. Now, yourself first implies yourself. Singular. But then secondly, it takes into yourselves plurally as a body of believers. When you're filled with the Spirit of God, now, man, you're going to start speaking to yourself, praise God. Now, you're going to be talking to the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is going to be talking to you. Now, you might be walking around and somebody says, dear God, is He talking to Himself? Is she talking to herself? Yes, she is. Now, why don't you just get up a little bit closer and see what the conversation is all about? Amen. Now, now, because I can tell you the conversation is going to be uh, uh, speaking the truth in love. Uh, if you're filled with the Spirit of God, when you're speaking to yourself, amen. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's not hard to understand, is it? But now, watch. We're talking about let's get stirred up. So the Bible said this speaking to yourselves in what? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the congregation. No. To the world! No. The world should love my singing. Yeah. The world don't care enough about you singing about amazing grace. That's right. Right. No. That's right. Not unless it's a sinner out in the world that's under the conviction of the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. Yeah. Then God might use saying amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Yeah. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I say, might use it, dear God, to stir up their heart. Amen. Yeah. And bring them to saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. What's the fifth way? First, to get stirred up. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. What are we supposed to sing, preacher? We're supposed to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Right. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Right. Uh oh, now here we go. I'm going to slow down now so you can stay with me. 
Okay? Making of books, there is no end. Give attendance to reading. Hello. One of the songs everybody loves so much is We've Got a Godly Heritage, or We've Got a Godly Heritage. We do. We sure do. Now, here's one of the places you can find out about some of our godly heritage. This is a book published in 1888 by Henry S. Burridge, and it's titled Baptist Hymn Writers and Their Hymns. Mm -hmm. We sit around in church all of our life and never know the story behind the hymns that we sing. But do you know what? You can search if you really want to. And you can study if you really want to. And you can see if you really want to. And it's been made real easy because we've got the internet in our homes now. So you can search libraries in England. You can search libraries in Scotland. You can search libraries in Ireland. You can search libraries in Germany. You can search libraries all around the world. And then friend, listen now, if you want a copy of a book like this, they're out there. You can get on the internet, man, and, and all you gotta do is just go to some of those places like abebooks.com or ibisbooks.com uh, uh, and then you can just, just type it in and, and you can even put how much you want to give for it, how much you don't want to give for it, whether you want a new copy, whether you want an old copy, whether you want it hardbound, whether you want it paperback, however you want it free or not. And if it's anywhere in the world in somebody's bookstore, uh, it's on abebooks.com, uh, it's going to show you where it's at and it's going to tell you how to order it. Amen. So it's not that these things are no longer available. It's, this is the meanest thing I'm going to say this morning. It's we don't care. Yeah. Right. Because we'd rather spend our time and our money on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Right? Now it's the meanest thing I'm going to say all day. Promise you. How do we get stirred up? We get stirred up by singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. But now before I get into this book right here, listen, go with me just a little bit further because it says this, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And so that takes the singular, singing unto yourselves and speaking unto yourselves and punching in the plural in the body as we gather together. This is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to speak to yourselves and we're supposed to sing to yourselves. Amen. Yeah. Now, listen. You do have a godly heritage. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And I'm going to read you some examples this morning. If you want to listen. The first few that I'm going to read to you go all the way back to the time when we were called Anabaptists, meaning rebaptizers. We're going back to the time of the Reformation. Michael Sattler. Not so much is known of Michael Sattler, another of the Swiss Anabaptist martyr singers. His home was in Stauffen, Brescia, and before connecting himself with the Reform movement, he was a monk. You realize how many of those old Baptist preachers back in the Reformation had originally been a part of the Catholic institution? Right. Yeah, God. <laughs> he was arrested by the authorities in Zurich in the latter part of 1525 and was banished from the Canton. He was afterward arrested in Strasbourg and May the 21st, 1527 at Rottenburg on the Neckar. 
His tongue was torn out while his body was lacerated with hot tongs and then burned. His character was such that the Strasbourg evangelical pastors after his death did not hesitate to call him a martyr of Christ. The seventh hymn in Osbert containing 13 stanzas of four lines is by Michael Sattler and has the ring of the martyr spirit as, for example, these lines. This isn't the whole thing, but listen. Now, they wrote those hymns to the times that they were in to be an encouragement to others. But it's an encouragement to me. Amen. Listen. If one ill treat you for my sake, and daily you to shame awake, be joyful, your reward is nigh, prepared for you in heaven on high. Of such a man fear not the will, the body only he can kill. A faithful God, the rather fear, who can condemn to darkness drear. O Christ, help thou thy little flock, who faithful follow thee, their rock. By thine own death redeem each one, and crown the work that thou hast done. Man, I'm telling you, I don't know about you, I read that, it stirs me up, amen. And somebody said, preacher, I don't know if, if I would have the faith that I to be able to die a martyr's death. If you ever had to die a martyr's death, friend, you would have to worry one little bit. God would give you grace, and you'd be able to die just like these. Listen, here's the second one now, George Wagner. George Wagner was pastor of the Anabaptist Church in Munich. He was a man of irreproachable character, and his holy life committed to all about him the gospel which he delighted to preach. Every possible effort was made to induce him to deny the doctrines he had accepted, but in vain. And at length he was thrown into prison. There he was visited by the Duke who first by means of the scriptures and then by means of promises endeavored to secure his his recantation. But Wagner was immovable and he was at length condemned to death. On his way to execution it was sometime in 15 27, his wife and children implored him to abandon his heresy and save his immortal soul. All these and others equally earnest entities were unavailing. At the stake, Wagner lifted his eyes toward heaven and offered this petition. Father, my father, there is much in the world that is dear to me. My wife, my children, my life, but dearer than wife, children, and life, Art thou my father? Nothing shall separate me from thy love. To thee I consecrate myself wholly as I am in life and in death. And he added, I am ready. I know what I'm doing. Then joyfully he turned to his executioners and welcomed the flames in which as in a chariot his spirit ascended to the sky. Now listen. The following is the first stanza of a hymn, 34 in Ausbund, written by Wagner. We praise our Father, God, to Him Hosanna's bring, who saves us by the precious blood, our all atoning King, the Son whom He has given to take away our sin, that faithful as His children here, we heaven at length may win. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of y'all. I'm saying that stirs my heart. Amen. Leonhard Schreiner, prominent among the Anabaptists in Upper Austria, was Leonhard Schreiner. He belonged to a good family and was carefully educated in Vienna and other places. At length, he became a monk. After an experience of six years in a monastery of the barefooted order, he made his escape. <laughs> Man, I like the terminology. Yeah. <laughs> and not long after, meeting Hugmeier and later Hans Hutt and Oswald Blake, who were holding religious services in Vienna in secret, he accepted their teachings and was baptized. At once he began to preach the new evangel. At Steyr, whither he made his way early in 1527, he baptized a number of converts. 
Thence he proceeded to other places in Austria and Bavaria, preaching and baptizing. In Tyrol, he was recognized by a Franciscan monk who betrayed him, having been arrested. He was brought to trial and sentenced to death. He was beheaded and his body was afterward burned January the 14th, 1528 at Rottenburg on the Inn, where later 70 of his followers also sealed their faith with their blood. From a fine hymn, 31 in Ausbund by Schreimer, I take the following. Thy holy place they have destroyed, thy altars overthrown, and reaching forth their bloody hands, have foully slain thine own. And we alone, thy little flock, the few who still remain, are exiles wandering through the land in sorrow and in pain. We are at last like scattered sheep, the shepherd not in sight, each far away from home and hearth, and like the birds of night that hide, that hide away in rocky cliffs, we have our rocky hold, yet near at hand as for the birds, there waits the hunter bold. We wander in the forest dark with dogs upon our track, and like the captive silent lamb, men bring us prisoners back. They point to us amid the throng, and with their taunts of fear, and long to let the sharpened axe on heretics descend. Amen. For years, this old hymn was sung in churches. I haven't asked Brother Jeff about all that's going in the new hymnal. And I'm telling you, some of this is what's going to be in there. I'm not going to read to you this particular man's life. You've heard of him. His name is Joseph Stitt. He wasn't one of the Anabaptists. But what I am going to read to you is I'm going to read to you one of the hymns that he wrote. Lord, at thy table I behold the wonders of thy grace, but most of all admire that I should find a welcome place. I that am all defiled with sin, a rebel to my God, I that have crucified His Son and trampled on His blood. What strange, surprising grace is this that such a soul has room. My Savior takes me by the hand, my Jesus bids me come. Eat, O oh my friends, the Savior cries, the feast was made for you. For you I groaned and bled and died and rose in triumph to Him. With trembling faith and bleeding heart, Lord, we accept thy love. Tis a rich banquet we have had. What will it be above? Ye saints below and hosts of heaven, join all your praise and powers. No theme is like redeeming love. No Savior is like ours. Had I ten thousand hearts, dear Lord, I'd give them all to thee. Had I ten thousand tongues, they all should join the harmony. Amen. Amen. Well, I can go on and on there. Here's one some of y'all are familiar with. 101 Hymn Stories by Kenneth W. Osborne. Some of y'all actually have this book. Daniel, Daniel W. Whittle was born in Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts on November the 22nd, 1840. At the age of 21, he joined the 72nd Illinois Infantry, enlisted in Company B as a second lieutenant. Later, he rose to the rank of major on General O. O. Howard's staff. He was with General Sherman on his march to the sea and was later wounded at the Battle of Vicksburg. Upon his recovery and return home, he met the noted evangelist D.L. Moody. His relationship with Moody changed the course of Whittle's life. After a rather, rather brief time in business with the Elgin Watch Company, whose treasure he became, he was persuaded by Moody to enter full-time evangelistic work. Soon he became known as one of the leading evangelists of his day. Whittle always worked with a gospel singer and song leader. His first such associate was Philip P. Bliss. That's P. P. Bliss whose tragic death in the Osterbula, Ohio train wreck in 1876 ended a most happy relationship. J. 
James McGranahan succeeded Bliss as major widow singing companion. The greater number of widows, more than 200 hymn texts, were set to music by McGranahan. Most of widows' hymns bore the, uh, the, the sodium El Nathan. Hello? How many times have you noticed in your hymnal as the composer El Nathan? I'm telling you this morning who El Nathan is. Hello? Moody once said, I think Major Whittle has written some of the best hymns of this century. Together, Whittle and McGranahan made several trips to Great Britain for evangelistic crusades and traveled extensively in this country until about 1890 when McGranahan's health began to fail. At Northfield, Massachusetts on March the 4th, 1901 at the age of 61, Major Daniel W. Whittle completed his colorful and fruitful pilgrimage and went to be with the Lord he loved and served so faithfully. James McGranahan was born on July the 4th, 1840 near Adamsville, Pennsylvania, a Scot-Irish descent. From his, early, from his earliest years, his rare tenor voice had been the delight of all who heard it. Many encouraged him to enter the operatic field, a career in which it was felt he would certainly achieve success. For some time, Philip Bliss had encouraged McGranahan to devote his total life to the evangelistic ministry. Upon hearing of Bliss's tragic accident in Ashkabla, Ohio, on December the 29th, 1876, McGranahan went immediately to the site, seeking to identify the body and to locate some remembrance of his beloved friend. Neither the body of Bliss nor his wife were ever found. Moving about in the large crowd gathered at the site of the accident, McGranahan recognized Major Whittle, although they had never before met. The Major, too, had heard previous accounts from Bliss about the talented James McGranahan and how, his man, how this man should be in full-time Christian service. The Major immediately challenged McGranahan to be the gospel musician God could use to replace Philip Bliss. Before leaving the site of the accident together, they found Bliss's trunk undamaged containing the text from My Redeemer, which Bliss had evidently been working on during the trip. McGranahan immediately began composing the music for this text. And at, that, and at their next service in Chicago, he introduced the song where it made a great spiritual impact upon the congregation. Thus was begun between these two men a fruitful evangelistic ministry as well as a productive output of the many fine gospel songs of which they collaborated. After many years of constant labor in the evangelistic field, McGranahan was compelled by failing health to retire to private life. But the, his remaining years, even to the last, were spent in composing hymns for the use of the master's service. He died on July the 9th, 1907, at the age of 67, resting upon his favorite scripture verses, John 6, 47. James McGranahan is also the composer of the hymn, My Redeemer. Here's one that he's noted for. I'll stand by until the morning. You ever heard this? Fierce and wild, the storm is raging round a helpless bark. On to doom, tis swiftly driving o'er the waters dark. Joy, behold the Savior, joy, the message here. I stand by until the morning. I've come to save you. Do not fear. Yes, I stand by until the morning. I've come to save you. Do not fear. Amen. The second verse says, Weary, helpless, hopeless seamen, fainting on the deck, with what joy they hail their Savior as he hands or as he hails their wreck. Verse three. On a wild and stormy ocean, seeking this the way, souls that perish heed the message, Christ has come to save. The last verse, darling death, this thy soul to rescue, he is love has come. Leave the wreck and in any trusting thou shall reach thy home. Joy, behold the Savior, joy the message here. I stand by until the morning, I've come to save you, do not fear. Yes, I stand by until the morning, I come to save you, do not fear. Amen. Amen. Here's one you're familiar with. Throughout our country, this hymn has been for many years one of the stalwart hymns 
in evangelical churches, especially the Baptist churches. The authorship of the text has always been a mystery to hymnologists. It first appeared, its first appearance was in 1787 in a hymnal, selection of hymns published by Dr. John Rippon, pastor of the Carters Lane Baptist Church, London, England. Dr. Rippon was pastor of this important church for 63 years and was considered to be one of the most popular and influential dissenting ministers of his time. The hymn appeared anonymously in his collection with the author indicated merely as K. Later reprints also gave K-M and one King, K-E-E-M. Since the music director in Dr. Rippon's church was named R. King, it, was generally, it has generally been thought that he was the author of the text. Rippon's hymnal was, was exceedingly popular immediately. Eleven editions were printed in England before the pastor's death in 1836. An American edition was also printed by the Baptist churches in Philadelphia in 1820. This hymnal has often been called the unofficial hymn textbook for Baptist churches. How firm a foundation. Amen. How firm a foundation became well known throughout our northern and southern states during the time of the Civil War and was included in most American publications of that time. The composer of this music is also unknown. It has been established that the tune is one of the sturdy folk tunes originating in the South. First appeared in 1837 in William Caldwell's publication Union Harmony. Like many of our fine hymns, this text is really a sermon in verse. In the first stands of the sure foundation of the Christian faith is established as being the Word of God. Hey. This challenging question is posed. What more can God do than provide His very Word as a completed revelation of Himself to man? The succeeding verses personalize the precious promises from His Word. Verse 2 comes from Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Amen. Verse 3 comes from Isaiah 43, verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. Amen. Verse five, or verse 4 comes from 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Verse 5 comes from Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. How firm a foundation has been a favorite hymn and testimony of many of God's children throughout the year. It was the favorite of such American leaders as Theodore Roosevelt, Andrew Jackson, who requested that it be sung at his bedside shortly before he died at the uh, Hermitage, as well as Robert E. Lee, who, was who, who also requested it for his funeral hymn as an expression of his full trust in the ways of the Heavenly Father. Amen. You know the song? But we sing them dry eyed, cold hearted, and stiff necked. I'm going to give you one more and I'll be through this morning. Let's get stirred up. This beloved gospel hymn was written on March the 26th, 1862. The author, Joseph H. Gilmore, has left the following account. I had been speaking at the Wednesday evening service of the First Baptist Church in Philadelphia, corner of Broad and Arch Streets, about the 23rd Psalm, and had been especially impressed with the blessedness of being led by God. At the close of the service, we had joined Deacon Watson's pleasant hall, where we were being entertained. During our conversation, the blessedness of God's leading so grew upon me that I took out my pencil, wrote the hymn just as it stands today, handed it to my wife, and thought no more of it. She sent it without my knowledge to the Watchman and Reflector magazine, and there it first appeared in print. Three years later, I went to Rochester, New York to preach as a candidate for the Second Baptist Church. Upon entering the chapel, I took up a hymn book thinking, I wonder what they sing. The book opened up and He leadeth me. <laughs> that was the first time I knew that my hymn 
and found a place among the songs of the church. Joseph H. Gilmore was born in Boston, Massachusetts on April the 29th, 1834. His father was the governor of the state of New Hampshire for a period of time. Joseph graduated from the Newton Theological Seminary in 1861. Throughout his lifetime, he pastored several Baptist churches, served as a secretary to his father, the governor, was a professor of Hebrew at Newton Seminary, and later taught English literature at Rochester University, where he published several college texts on these subjects. He also wrote other hymns, but none ever gained the acceptance that he leadeth me did. Although Gilmore was highly respected both in religious and educational circles, he is best remembered for this hurriedly written text when he was just 28 years of age and a visiting supply preacher in Philadelphia. William W. Bradbury, an important contributor to the development of early gospel hymnology, said this text in the Watchman and Reflector magazine in 1863, or saw it, and wrote this fitting melody to match the words. He also added two additional lines to the chorus. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Other hymns by William Bradbury include Jesus Loves Me, Just As I Am, Depth of Mercy, Even Me, Sweet Hour of Prayer, and Solid Rock. The hymn perhaps more, this hymn perhaps more than any other modern hymn has been translated into many different languages. Servicemen during World War II were greatly surprised to find that one of the favorite hymns sung by the primitive Polynesians in the South Pacific. Man. <laughs> when the first Baptist church building in Philadelphia at the busy broad and art intersection was demolished in 1926, it was replaced by a large office building. In the corner of the building was placed a bronze tablet, which still remains today, containing the words of the first verse of He Leadeth Me. This was done, states the inscription, in recognition of the beauty and fame of this beloved hymn and in remembrance of its distinguished author. Thank you, Lord. Amen. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught, whate'er I do, wherever I be, Still tis, tis God's hand that leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, by water still or troubled sea, still tis His hand that leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp Thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine, content whatever lot I see, since tis my God that leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grave the victory is won. In death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. Yes. Amen. 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 Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Search the scriptures. Study to show yourself approved under God and work and need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Speaking the truth in love. And singing. Songs. Hymns. Spiritual songs. Singing to make the melody in the heart. Amen. Unto the Lord. Let's get stirred up this morning, church. We got a lot to be stirred up for. Amen. Mitzi, come pin, if you will, please. <clears throat> Bet y'all didn't know that John Bunyan was also him, right? You just thought he wrote things like Pilgrim's Progress and Holy Wars. An abounding grace. But John Bunyan was also a great Baptist in life. You've got a great heritage this morning, church. Amen. And we ought to be stirred up about it. Let's stand your feet this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed. There's absolutely no reason for us as God's children to be dead and cold. Hard hearted. Yeah. Mitzi's playing softly this morning.
I give you five ways for you to get stirred up over Jesus. Altar's over. Baptist, one by one pastors started introducing singing to the congregation by writing hymns themselves that would apply to the message that they were preaching. Benjamin Keach is one of the first. And then even in that introduction, Brother Lee, that what they did was they would only sing one hymn and it would be after the message. So those that didn't want to partake in singing in the sanctuary could hear the message preached, but then they would give them a period of time to leave if they felt that that wasn't befitting of the Lord. We've come a long way. And we've got a great heritage. And I'm thankful for men like Benjamin Keach, pastors that saw the need just like the singers of the Old Testament and the temple and the tabernacle, that they saw that that was a part of the worship and service of God and introduced and started writing those old hymns and started singing in our churches. Amen. Don't neglect the heritage you have this morning, church. You've got so much to be thankful for and you've got so much to be stirred up about. And... <coughs> I, I don't know, maybe I get carried away differently than other people do, but but I sit down and read stuff like that and I just get beside myself. Amen. I see the great character of the saints of yesteryear. And then it just it stirs me up. Just like we're supposed to be stirred up from the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles. Listen, we still have a history and we still have a heritage that you need to read along with this. Amen. Yeah. So you can continue to be stirred up. And stirred up to the point that 
you want to do something in your lifetime just in case Jesus doesn't come. Somebody will read about us 50 years from now or 100 years from now or 150 years from now if Jesus doesn't come and be able to be stirred up about what we did for Jesus. Heads about eyes are closed. But Mark, you dismiss us in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for being in your house today. We thank you for the message we heard. I pray to God you stir our hearts for the things of God in your word. I pray, Lord, you help us to go out and tell others. Dear Lord, we have so much to tell and so much to share of what you've done for us at Calvary and shedding your precious blood and, and your precious word that you've given us. I pray to God that you'd help us to obey your word. Help us, Lord, to come back tonight. I pray that you'd be with the preacher tonight. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'll let you. God bless you.